Is it the fastest boat on land or the fastest car on the water? Amphibious cars are a unique addition to the world of cars and boats. They try to combine the best of both worlds. Are they a jack of two trades or a master of none? Welcome everyone to a floaty episode 54 of the Automotive History series, where we are going to dive deep into the history of the amphibious car. Cars have been around us for almost 150 years now, but boats? They've been around us a bit longer, well, like uh, 10,000 years or so. So in order for a boat car to appear, we already had the boat, but we were waiting for a car to be invented. Or is it? Amphibious vehicles have been around us a bit longer than that. In fact, the story goes that the very first attempt at creating an amphibious vehicle already happened as far back as the early 1800s. Oliver Evans was a genius American inventor fascinated with the latest and greatest technology, steam power. He wanted to create a steam-powered vehicle that could roll on land and float on water to help the dredging business. He succeeded in creating a first prototype called the Oructor Amphibolus, and I hope I said that right. The contraption was in essence nothing more than a barge with a steam engine that could float, with some wheels attached to it. But Evans not only created an amphibious vehicle, but also accidentally created one of the very first steam-powered cars in the process, if you count this as a car. Anyway, the Oructor was a great first attempt at creating an amphibious vehicle, but failed immediately. Not because the 17-ton contraption instantly sank, but it just sucked at everything. It wasn't maneuverable on water or land. And although I'm convinced that before and after the Oructor there have been attempts at creating an amphibious vehicle, many people backed off, and overall interest was low. Because where the amphibious vehicle might not be all too practical for personal and recreational use, this type of car could be interesting for the military. Amphibious car development was limited to amateurs trying to build contraptions in the home garage, often leading to nothing particularly spectacular. Until the Second World War, when various nations set up development programs to create a vehicle that could conquer any terrain, including a liquid one. Both the Allied and Axis powers were busy working on a boat car. The Allied forces already had a strong land vehicle at their disposal, the famous Jeep. And so making a vehicle that was equally capable on water as it was on land was the next step. After the development was finished, the Ford Motor Company was given a contract to build what is called the Ford GPA, essentially a Jeep built for the water. And it quickly gained the nickname Seep, meaning Sea Jeep. Unfortunately, the car wasn't a success. On water it was unwieldy and on land it was too heavy, so it could not carry a lot of stuff, nor could it handle a slightly rough sea, and even if the vehicle did manage to make it on land, you could get stuck. One story goes that it would also get stuck in shallow water, the same shallow water a regular jeep could easily drive through. On the other side, the German forces had more success at creating a military amphibious car. Well, not actually the forces, but one man, Hans Trippel. In the 1930s, he created an amphibious car that actually wasn't too bad. The Trippel SG6 was originally intended for commercial and personal use. You know, uh, a toy for the rich or a promotional vehicle for businesses. But considering its heavy retail price, Hans could never live off of selling these to regular people alone. Until the German army stepped in. The German army bought a bunch of SG6 Schwimmwagens and Trippel decided to throw his dignity out of the window and became a war profiteer in the process. Eventually, the SG6 would be replaced by the Volkswagen Schwimmwagen, an amphibious version of the Volkswagen Kübelwagen, essentially the Jeep of Germany. And to put it bluntly, the Schwimmwagen was nothing more than a beetle that could float. Call it a beetle boat. After the war was over, the need for amphibious cars, other than the military, once again waned. But it became Hans Trippel's personal crusade to provide the world with some form of floating four-wheeled fun. All throughout the 1950s, he first made sure to subscribe to Ed's Auto Reviews and watch some of his videos before he worked on creating a new and updated version targeted for personal use based on previous experiences with the SG6. By 1961, he released the final result after years of trying, the Amphicar 770. Look at it. Isn't this just fantastic? We're looking at a floating melting pot of different cars. The Amphicar was powered by a 1.2 liter Triumph Herald four-cylinder mounted in the rear that also connected to two propellers under the rear bumper. 
Power output was a whopping 43 seahorses, pushing the car up to speeds of around 100 km or 60 miles per hour on land, and about 13 km or 8 miles an hour on the water. And for your nautical folks, that's about 7 knots. The car featured a heavily sloped front end for easy entry into the water. Being a part-time boat, it also required navigational lights and a flagpole. On the back, some tail fins, and I'd like to say this was simply a stylistic purpose, it was the Space Age after all, but one source knows that they actually protected the air intakes on the trunk from incoming water. It had no rudder, instead the front wheels were your rudder. And after you were done playing with your amphi, you'd had to grease the car at 13 points, partially to prevent it from leaking if it didn't already. As always, the car sucked at everything. It wasn't particularly fast on the road, and it wasn't particularly fast on the water, and it wasn't easy to steer either. It drove like a boat on the road and handled like a... a, a, a car on the water. But at the same time, it could also boast about being the fastest boat on land and the fastest car in the water. Uh -huh. Triple hoped to sell some 20,000 units, but production stopped after about 3,800 units. Most of them were sold in the United States. Some found their way with right-hand drive into the UK, where they also sail on the left side of the river, and a couple of them were used by the Berlin Police Department in Germany. Changing regulations in the US was the death knell for the MV car. A famous anecdote is that one particular customer was the American president Lyndon B. Johnson. He would take his unassuming guests for a little ride around his estate, drive up to a lake, scream that the car had no brakes and drive straight into the water, scaring its passengers only to find out it could float. And I wonder if these guests didn't notice the boat-like appearance before getting in, but let's not get too much into the details. I don't want to disregard any other attempts of creating an ambitious amphibious car, but the entire history of the amphibious car is pretty much the story of the amphi car. After its discontinuation in the mid-60s, not many notable attempts were made until the 2000s. By the early 2000s, the New Zealand slash American slash British, pick one, company Gibbs introduced the Gibbs Al-Qaeda, mm. oh no not Al-Qaeda, uh, the Aquada. Although a limited production concept car, it was quite an improvement over the many other amphibious attempts. The car boat was powered by a 2.5 liter V6 from Rover, and Richard Branson, successful businessman and part-time adventurer, managed to cross the English Channel with an Aquada in 1 hour and 40 minutes, crushing the previous record. And it would take a while before this record would be broken again, if ever. I'm disappointed. I thought we were going to make it. Oh, sorry, mate. The cup sank. All was well with Gibbs until they realized they borrowed engines from the wrong car company. Right around the time the first Aquada hit the ro uh, water, the Rover car company folded and could no longer provide engines. About 4,000 were made and the car laid the foundations for some other aquatic models made by Gibbs. Now, I could name a bunch of other attempts that were a relative success, but the story is always the same. As wonderful and well executed these cars are, they all suffer from the same disadvantages. Mainly trying to combine the best of both worlds, but often suck at both or be good at one and neglect the other. And then there is the usability and the price tag. These cars are pricey and simply remain a toy. Why? Well, ignoring the price tag and that it wouldn't sink, the usability is a huge problem. In order to be a viable transport option, you need boat ramps everywhere. Only then it starts to get interesting to skip the regular rush hour traffic jam and hit the open waters. But these are amphibious cars. Amphibious vehicles, in general, on the other end, are a well-established category. The military uses some high-tech all-terrain vehicles. You have very practical amphibious ATVs. And what about floating buses? Here in the Netherlands, there were a bunch of amphibious buses specifically for tourists. They take you around the ports of Rotterdam or the canals of Amsterdam. And to be fair, <laughs> it's quite hilarious to see one of these casually passing by on the water like it's the most normal thing in the world. And what about the Amphi car? It remains a collectible classic and has a cult following. The boat is found in museums, you can rent them for a day out on the water, there are owner meetups and clubs, and you can hire them for weddings. In fact, I was lucky enough to catch one once in the wild, with a wedding couple in the back seat, most likely floating downriver to a waterfront church. And so the last thing I want to talk about is the relationship between the boat and the car. 
The car industry has a loving relationship with the aircraft industry. Many design principles and styling themes have been carried over from the aircraft industry by the car industry, and a great example is aerodynamics. But what about the boating industry? Well, with a bit of an imagination, boats look to some degree like cars, and vice versa. Some American boat manufacturers took styling cues from cars and applied them to their speedboat models, like wraparound windshields, car-inspired dashboards and gauges, and sometimes even tail fins. And so have there been cars that look a bit like boats or adopted a nautical theme? One of the most notable of all is this bad boy right here, the early 50s Fiat 1100 with custom bodywork, or should I say boatwork, done by coach builder Carrozzeria Coriasco. The car was built for promotional purposes but doesn't actually float. It is just a car. It's just a car with a boat-like design, but this one just shows that cars can look a lot like boats and boats can look a lot like cars. But this is an extreme example. There have been cars in the past that featured what could be described as a boat-inspired design, but that is a lot more subtle. Think of the so-called boat-tail cars, like the fast speedsters of the 1930s and the Buick Graviera models of the 1970s. Although named the boat tail, I think their origins lies more in the aircraft than the boat industry, but what do I know? This isn't ads boat reviews after all. Another example of the late 70s Pontiacs, featuring a very sharp hood line with a dubious resemblance to the front end, no, no wait, the bow of a boat. Even more subtle are the appearance packages on some cars that embrace the yacht and boat life. Usually called the Marina theme, it's a combination of white and blue. Think of the AMC Rebel Mariner station wagon in the 70s, or the latest Lincoln Navigators with the coastal blue interior package. And last but not least, the Rolls-Royce boat tail, where the trunk mimics the texture of the deck of a boat. And that concludes our little dive into the history of the amphibious car and the relationship between the boat and the car. It will always remain a toy, a gimmick that most of the time sucks at everything, but makes up for it through its magical experience of carelessly plunging into the water and leisurely continue from there. Plus, you can truly say your car drives like a boat. <laughs>